Hey, everybody, and welcome to another webinar episode, this time with a very special guest today. Uh, I'll introduce him in a minute, just waiting for people to drop in. Uh, the entire session will be recorded, as always, uh, and will be displayed on our website and shared on our channels. Um, so also welcome to the people tuning in later. Um, let's just give it a few, few more seconds. So we start at 2 p.m. If you're so kind to introduce yourself, if you want to, in the chat box where you're from, it's always nice to see a bit of geographical spread in the audience. Uh, I was just chatting to Michael, which uh, whom I will introduce in a minute, that we're sitting in very, very similar rooms. You could just very well be next door, but I believe Michael is in South Africa at the moment and I'm in Amsterdam. Uh, hello so, yes. from Belgium. What's that? I'm saying I'm in, I, in Cape Town. I think we've got some, yeah. some Cape Dutch architecture going on above me and above you. So. Yeah. <laughs> Could very well be the case, yeah. Right, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm introducing the guest of today. Born with a naturalist heart and curiosity, Michael Lawrence has devoted more than 35 years, and that's a lot, to guiding people in the African bush. He traveled to every corner of the African continent from the teeming floodplains of Chad, which we will talk about today, to the windswept dunes of the Namib Desert. He's a proud member of our Principal Wildlife Advisory Board since day one. And over the years, we had beautiful, uh, touching conversations about uh, the future of Principal Wildlife. He has visited almost every park managed by African parks, which is definitely on the agenda for today. And if there's one thing I learned during my personal time in Africa, it's that the art of guiding is a true craft. And today he will tell us all about it. Welcome, Michael. P, thank you very much. And welcome to all of you who've joined for today's session. Very exciting. And um, I'm really honored to, to be invited to join this, uh, this very August group. Prince for Wildlife is very much uh, one of my passions. I must say up front that I'm a bit of an imposter photographer. I'm definitely a, a guide first. And, um, and a wannabe photographer, but it's it's wonderful to be here and to be part of this journey. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. I see uh, I already announced people to introduce themselves in the chat box. The chat box is where you can post your questions. It's a very interactive, interactive session today. I see there's people from Pretoria, from Bavaria and Germany, from Brazil, Nairobi, Canada, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first question for you, Michael. Traveling back in time a bit, I mean, you spent 35 years in the 35 years in the bush. But tell us a little bit how little Michael once fell in love with that bush. It's a good question, actually. Um, how much must I divulge? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of my very first bush memories actually was quite a terrifying one. I was probably about four or five years old, and um, we went to visit the Kruger National Park with the whole family. And I have uh, four siblings, so it's a big family. We had two cars. I was sitting in the front seat with my aunt in a very small Volkswagen Beetle. And we were going along the road, and a bull elephant stepped between the vehicle in front and us. And um, it turned around and, and, and gave a, a head shake and put its ears up and did what today is I would perfectly well understand. But in those days, it was terrifying as it sort of lumbered down the road towards us. My very first experience of, of the African bush was pure terror, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, it's, it's changed, perhaps in some way that inspired me to find out more about it. But um, I was definitely one of those, uh, those sort of irritating children who collected plants and insects and feathers. And I really was a naturalist from the very beginning. It was my passion. And... I knew growing up that whatever I did, it, it would have to be around wildlife. Um, I had aspirations for photography, um, but uh, I ended up more on the guiding side, which I, I'm very grateful for. Was it your parents that passed it down? Uh, my father a was a surgeon. My mother was a, um, a gardener. And so she, we definitely, as an entire family, had a passion for the natural world, but I didn't grow up um, in a guiding family that was uh in the beginning i think they disapproved of the choice entirely self-made they say these days eh? <laughs> well, 
So let's see if we can uh, uh, dive a bit into your connection with African parks. I mean, it's our beneficiary uh, for obvious reasons. I know you're a very, very big fan of their policy, strategy, philosophy. Just tell us a bit about your first introduction with African parks, and then we can zoom uh, we can zoom on to uh, uh, one of your favorite parks in their portfolio, Zakuma. So I was first introduced to uh, African parks in about 2011. <clears throat> a close friend of mine who who worked with them at the time. And um, I met with Peter. We spoke a lot about their, you know, their, their ethos, their, their ambitions, their vision. And I fell very much in love with what they were doing. Um, I think it was almost a crossroads in my life when for a moment I thought of joining them full time, actually, and, and stopping guiding. However, um, meeting Peter in that very first discussion, we, we spoke at length about... Um, Sakuma. I was very keen to go and see Garamba um, as my first sort of African parks park. And he said, yeah, it's fantastic. It's wonderful one day. But first, you really should go to Sakuma. That is the place that is most extraordinary. And I'd heard about Sakuma um, following, you know, the early stories coming out with Nick Nichols photographs, etc. Mm -hmm. That early National Geographic story. And I went up in 2012 um, with African parks and spent a week at Tinga, and it was one of the most amazing uh, weeks of my life. Um, you know, at the time, um, there really was no tourism at all. It wasn't even a concept at that stage. So we're talking uh, what year? 2012, yeah, oh, so yeah. only yeah. 10 years ago now. And AP had just taken over. It was very early in their story. Um, Rian and Lorna were managing it, uh, extraordinary couple, and... Um, Fat Jean, who is still is now with African Parks, was there as well. And we had a wonderful time. I was left to my own devices much of much of the day and sort of walked around and sat at the um, the drying up water holes, took lots of photographs, just had I think it was for me, um, it was like going back to the Africa I, I had I'm not even sure I experienced in my youth. It was an Africa I almost dreamt of. Yeah. It was that truly wild and remote. And that cemented my relationship with um, with African parks. And um, we'll talk a bit more about Sakuma in a moment. And from there, we started... But I mean, just just, inter just quickly interrupting yeah. you, to just give a bit of context to the situation. But we're talking 2012, which means that yeah. parks like Masamara and Serengeti were already very well established. But at the same time, Sakuma, I, I mean, what, do you, what, did you, what did you find when you got there for the first time? How, in a country that is post-war... Post probably completely poached. Man, just give, give a bit of context. Absolutely. Like, um, It was still mind-blowing. It, it, Yes, it had a lot of challenges. It was early days. They'd come out of some very scary poaching years. Um, the elephant herd was hugely impacted, and we'll, we'll talk about that just now. I've got a few images that show you the then um, mm -hmm. and the now. They, uh, we, we'll speak about that in a moment because it really is actually... Um, it's an extraordinary story. It, 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 in many ways, it epitomizes the success story of African parks and I think has, has, um, has launched them in some ways into other areas, what they've been able to achieve there. You know, in the early days, the elephant herd was, was totally traumatized. Um, much of everything else was still pretty good, actually. Still lots of wildlife, not as much as there is now, but still... Um, the word for me that has always personified or, or um, been most relevant to Sakuma is abundance. It really is. There is just yeah. an abundance, including insect life. You know, whatever it is, it is it is in numbers. It's never um, you never get one of anything in Sakuma. Yeah. So those early days were highly impressive. I was really I was really amazed by the attitude of the lion. They're very different. Um, I think there's still some discussion about how genetically related they are to, mm. to um, West African lion or savanna lion or hybrid, but their behavior is very different. The way they see us is is very different. Um, but I divulge. I think that that original um, time spent with with African parks in Zakuma made me realize what could be done, and and was almost a turning point from a conservation perspective. You know, I think having guided for so long and having seen so many parts of Africa become depleted 
to a large extent. You, you fell in love with something that you want to hold on to for the future. Hmm. And the realization that we need to take conservation really seriously without being all doom and gloom about it, we need to take it very seriously. And we don't have a huge amount of time ahead. You know, I think the next 10 years will make a significant, will, will tell us a huge amount about what will be there in 30 to 50 years. And if we don't protect it now, um, yeah. we're not going to have it very simply. You know, we can, yeah. we can dig into that again a bit later. But from there, um, I went to a lot more of the African parks and started talking to them more about how, how you can build the relationship between conservation between travel and between philanthropy. Um, philanthropy is a, is a key piece of the conservation story. And I think that, that the correct type of travel can, um, can play a large role in supporting philanthropy for these places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's been a long journey, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to dive into that connection between conservation and philanthropy later, but let's see if we can visualize Zakuma for those that never heard about it. Uh, I'm sure you got a few impressive stories to tell. Uh, so let people just quickly walk them through the beauty and the, uh, the, the beauty of that park. Give me a second. I'm just going to um, open up a little slideshow here. Um, and then I need to, um, without being too much of a Luddite, I need to also make sure that I share screen with you. Give me a second. Yeah. So for people coming in uh, freshly into the chat, if you have any questions, please let me know. I can't promise I answer them right away, uh, but the few questions are coming in and I'm sure that we will answer them all towards the end of the of the webinar. Uh, so feel free uh, to um, ask anything about guiding in particular, about the connection maybe between guiding and conservation and so on. Is it working out, Michael? Um, it's not for a second, but give me a talk amongst yeah. yourselves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, uh, I'm sure Michael will uh, talk about that very same topic in a minute. But uh, the first, my first introduction to Sakuma was not necessarily Nick Nichols' images, but rather Brent Sturton, uh, who went there later on assignment for, uh, for AP, for African Parks. And, uh, I mean, if you look at, I haven't been myself, but if you look at the, the quality and the abundance of Sakuma now versus uh, 10 years ago. I think that's one of the main reasons why there is so, such a generic deep belief in African parks philosophy. It's a story that is uh, uh, that very well represents the way they operate in all their parks, the way they acquire new parks. So I'm hoping uh, uh, for you to be very impressed by the slideshow that Michael is starting in a, in a few seconds. Give me, um, sorry guys, we were having a little problem beforehand as well. You know what I might do, um, if you don't mind, we've got a few minutes. Um, I might just retransfer this to you. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. If you, if you don't mind so that we, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can, I can start it. And then before we dive into Zakuma, I can, so let me know if the, if the transfer is done and then I can, ask you a few other questions got a few things lined up here so no yeah, no worries and um you just if you just finalize the transfer and then uh, i will finalize that and um i won't uh, try and i won't try and multitask too much because i'm sure i'll fail <laughs> let's wait for that for a minute <clears throat> so let me just ask a question to the audience has any of you ever been to one of the african parks and if so where just let me know in the comments Could very well be the case that none of them has very been well to any, any AP park. It's on its way to you as we speak. Beautiful. Uh, so let's dive into another topic I've been, uh, I've been dying to discuss with you, and that is uh, the combination, the relationship between photography and guiding, and whether that's more of a contra contradictory one or a complementary one. I mean, m myself, I've been working with guides as well as photographers for a few years now and i do see that uh, it has a beautiful connection but it has a very very big tension at the same time 
So having 35 plus years experience, how do you look at that relationship between a guide in essence and a, a wildlife photographer in essence? It's a huge conversation actually. And I've got a number of, um, of thoughts on it. I, I think the first one is um, if you are first and foremost a guide, you have to accept that your photography is to a large extent always compromised. Uh, you are making decisions, you know, your, your day job, what you're being paid to do is to create an experience for others. It's not to be selfish. Mm. Um, the, the base principle of guiding is, is that, that it's not about you. And photography is all about you. It's a very um, selfish and very quite an insular um, profession to a large extent. It's you committed to your camera and the image. And to get the image you want, you have to be entirely focused on, um, on the amount of time you need to spend, the angle you need to have. You need to decide, am I going to wait for that shot or what am I going to do? As a guide, you're always making decisions that are often in conflict with your <laughs> to get a great shot. And maybe I'm just using that as an excuse as why I don't have any great shots. But but that <laughs> aside, it really, it's, it's if you allow that, to frustrate you as a guide, stroke photographer, I think you, you're you going to compromise both pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. So you have to decide when you go out there, am I going out to be a photographer or am I going out to be a guide? And you can have fun as a photographer and a guide, but be very careful that you are, that your agenda is honest to your guests' needs. So that, that's the first point. Um, I think another one is, and maybe a more a more complex one, and perhaps um, one that I think the professional photographers have a strong um, obligation and responsibility with, is what is the ethics around photography and wildlife and guiding? And when you're out there, um, how important is the image? You know, what what is it at all costs or is it first and foremost for the well-being of the wildlife? And that's a tricky, um, it's a tricky line. And I don't think it's ever 100% apparent. Uh, obviously, there are cases at both extremes that are apparent. But in the middle, it's complicated. You know, you look at, um, you look at something like the, the wildebeest crossing of the Mara River every year, which is, is quite frankly an embarrassment. You know, there's, yeah. there's almost no other way of putting it as if you look at it as a conservationist, as, um, as a guide, what goes on there is, um, is deeply extractive. It's deeply consumptive. It has a massive negative impact on, on wildlife, on, um, on, at so many levels, both environmentally, behaviorally, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot of professional photographers and amateur photographers who get lost in that moment. They get lost in the desire to have that perfect image, whether that is purely for the Instagram moment or whether it's for a more you know, lucrative professional um, result. I think we all need to be more cognizant of what we're doing out there in those moments and why. Um, and and that, that comes into both guiding and photography. I do think that photography... Um, has has uh, has pushed that boundary, particularly amateur photography, photographic tourism, has pushed that boundary quite hard. Um, Shem, I, I see that you're on on this uh, presentation, which which honors me and intimidates me photographically because you, I love your stuff so much. But I was listening to your talk the other day, and um, you were talking about the value of photography or for the value of photographs and the amount of photographs that are out there in the public space and how in the last 20 years that has shifted. And it's so true. There is such a plethora of extraordinary photographic images out there today that the photographer, particularly the amateur or semi-professional, and dare I say a, a guide photographer who is probably more guide than photographer. I put myself in that category. 
is very pushed to compete to get images that are extraordinary, unique, that stand out. And how we need to remain more cognizant and we need to have this conversation and we need to have this conversation with our guests about how we are interacting with the wilderness and with wildlife and making sure that, that the outcome is always ethically supportable. Um, so these are quite, it's quite a heavy conversation, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if that answers your basic question, but I, I think it is What's really, it? And, and I think the industry is changing. And I'm not sure that, um, I think the desire for the perfect image, to some extent, is also making us run too hard to look for the perfect experience in the bush. And at times taking us away from being more connected to the bush. So if you look at that a mutual degree of respect you should have for the wild, uh, is that mainly fostered, you believe, by knowledge? Or is there similar components that are equally important in that equation? Well, knowledge and agenda. Um, I think agenda is hugely important. You know, what are you there for? And if you're there as a photographic guide, I think the pressure to to come up with an extraordinary image for yourself and for your guest is greater than if you're there guiding. You know, I, I love walking. I think that that um, being in a vehicle is, of course, fabulous and you get much better um, general wildlife in a vehicle. But being on foot is really where you feel a greater sense of connection. And I always say that I personally never take a camera when I'm walking. I used to, but I don't anymore. And I encourage others not to. Because I think not having a camera is at times um, the only way that you really do connect with, uh, with nature. So I think everything in its moment, um, everything in its place, uh, and they certainly uh, walking away from an experience and being able to capture it and have those 10 or 15 extraordinary shots is spectacular. And we should all do that. We should all, all of us involved at Prince for Wildlife are um, are in love with the concept of photography, the creativity of photography, and indeed the triumph of photography. Uh, there's no question that on the upside, um, photography has allowed us to spread the word. It, it's a fantastic ambassador. You know, it fills in the color on, of the narrative, and I think it's inspired more and more people to want to come to Africa. It's inspired more and more people to. Um, to be interested in conservation and in Africa. You know, Prince for Wildlife and what it's achieved in three years is really quite extraordinary. And it speaks volumes for how photography can, can be a powerful medium to attract yeah. emotional support. Yeah. But the, duali the duality is remarkable. I mean, we just highlighted very briefly what the negative side of it is. And I also don't really see an immediate outcome But I think having the conversation as an industry uh, on a frequent level, I think is already a start of a solution. I think so. And I think, you know, you asked just now about, you know, the ingredients, knowledge. Um, what is knowledge? You know, knowledge is a combination of facts and, and also of experience and of wisdom and um, seeing how other people do it, um, length of time. Uh, so all these factors come into um, into play and, And professionalism, I think that um, we should all ask, and there's no question that, you know, that, that we all sometimes slip further down the line or the slope than yeah. we perhaps should. Um, we all catch ourselves. But I think we should all be encouraged to ask the questions of ourselves as travelers and as photographers. Yeah. Um, how, are we, how are we behaving? What, are we, what is our agenda when we're out there taking pictures of wildlife? Yeah. And don't ever forget, to be there in the moment. You know, I, yeah. I do a lot of guerrilla trekking. Um, I've probably done six or seven trips this year there. And um, I really encourage people as much as possible to leave their camera behind. Yeah. Yeah. Guerrilla photography is excruciatingly hard, very disappointing. The light is dreadful. Um, and, you know, you get lost in that lens and you, you miss so much. So and then the perhaps, one hour is over before you know it. So perhaps one of my greatest messages about, you know, wildlife photography is remember when to put the camera down. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Let's dive into Takuma. I've got the presentation here in front of me.
So let's see if screen sharing works on my end. I'm sure it does. Uh, right. So now you tell me whether or not you see this full screen. I do, um, cool. and I'm really pleased it works for you. I, cool. Yeah. So now you just tell me when to when to click. Exactly. I'll do that, and um, we'll dig into all of this a little bit more as people want. If there are any questions, um, so we've spoken already about Sakuma. For those who don't know, it's a, it's a park in the southeastern part of Chad. Chad is the um, fourth largest country in Africa, and um, it's, it's very much the actual heart. Malawi is always called the warm heart of Africa, um, but Chad uh, is right in the very center. If you look both east, west, north, south, um, in the old days when there was a, there was a huge amount of conflict and war um, leading through the early 2000s, and in those days, it was known as the black heart of Africa, which I've always found quite sad because it really isn't that anymore. Um, Chad is, is home to two parks of African parks. One is, is Enedi up in the north, another spectacular park, I think, um, from a landscape perspective. And if anyone has questions, please ask. From a landscape perspective, I don't think there's anywhere on earth um, that comes close to, to what Enedi has to offer. But Sakuma today in the southeast and very much sort of on the edge of the what they call the Sudanese and Sahil border environmentally. Um, if you flick through one more slide there, uh, it's a park of about 3,200 square kilometers. And I guess it, it is probably most similar for those of you who know Africa in some ways to South Luangwa. Um, I think many people will balk at that, but I say that because it is very seasonal. It's flat, and during the dry season, uh, which is when we there from, from January through until May, um, you get this, this pooling up of water into the dry riverbeds and into the, the seasonal pan systems. And then in the wet season, the whole area, particularly if you look um, more towards the, the east there, is almost entirely inundated. You know, the places that we traverse around um, when we're there in the, in the season are completely underwater for months of the year. Um, flick through again there, if you wouldn't mind. So uh, as I've already said, um, the word that springs to mind most is abundance. That image was taken uh, sort of 10 past five in the morning. Typically, you get up really early. You go around Regek Pan, and um, and you sit and you wait for the the quilia. And this is one of the of of all the experiences that I've ever had in my life anywhere, but specifically in Africa, the quilia early morning in in Sakuma is is just simply extraordinary. You've got flocks. Um, no one knows how many, but they, you know, they, they are at least 10 million in the main roost, possibly a lot more. And these flocks come down very early to avoid predation and they, they drink at the pan. So I was sitting there first light and this flock was just sort of buzzing over me. But I use it because it exemplifies everything um, about Sakuma. Flick through again, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so wherever you, wherever you are, whatever you're looking at, there is both abundance in numbers and also layers. You know, you've got in that photograph, Lul's heart of Yest, baboon, probably some warthog back there. Um, I'm sure there's a Tiang, there's a Roan, there's a Cordofan giraffe, lots of other birds. It's these layers and this, um, this you, know, you can drive around many parks in Africa, even some of the very well-known ones and, have a lot of, of empty gaps, um, whereas Zakuma in the dry season, you get very little of that. Carry on there. So one of the things that we were going to speak about, we've alluded to, uh, is the elephant story. This, this image was taken on my um, either my first or second trip to Zakuma. And at the time, the elephant herd was about 400. Um, in the preceding 10 years through very focused, very awful poaching. Um, the Janja weed came out of um, southern Sudan uh, on horseback and, and just decimated these herds. And um, in a sort of very short 
couple of years, they went from well over 4,000 to only 400. Uh, you know, it should also be noted that in in prior centuries, there had been literally millions of elephants in this area. It was one of the elephant strongholds of Africa. Anyway, this photograph, um, I think the most telling thing about it is if you look closely, there are no babies. And all of us who know Africa know that for elephant, everything is about family. Mm. So this herd at the time of 400 had one calf under five years old. And there are a couple of hypotheses for that. It's probably that any the, the degree of poaching forced this elephant herd to come together in this sort of whirling mass um, in self-protection. And possibly babies were stampeded in that, was, were, were trampled. Um, possibly there was just so much emotional trauma within the herd that the females were not conceiving. But whatever the case was, when African parks took over, this uh, remnant herd of 400 very traumatized, you couldn't get near them in a vehicle. Uh, you could get fairly close on foot if you were very careful. Uh, but if they got a sense of you, they often panicked and, and ran off. But and you felt it. There was something. Um, there was something deeply disturbed about being around this herd at that time. And then you um, you fast forward. African parks came in. They did an extraordinary job with anti poaching. Uh, first thing they really did, elephant poaching disappeared almost entirely. And uh, P, if you click forward there. Um, and maybe just this before you put, okay, I'm going to click forward. This is, I'll talk through it. Go, go back. Okay. I'll play it. Play it and I'll talk through it. Okay. Um, so this was in 2019. And at this point, over 120 babies had been born in the previous year since when I took that first photograph. And being on the, uh, on the Salamat River one morning, hot morning, as a large percentage, well over 200, maybe 300 in that herd, came down to drink was, was one of the most extraordinary. I, we were all in tears. It was a deeply emotional thing to, to have them to see how this herd had recovered. And if anything is a testimony to African parks, this little video is, in, in my view. Um, just enjoy this, this moment of so many elephants coming down. No end to it. Keeps on going. Well, no, it's just it, what there's a another. Side. Story. Yeah. What a side. Yeah, I mean, it's fast forwarded a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there, there we go. So that I think um, that this elephant story is is very much part of the entire Sakuma story, um, and the trust. You know, going from those early years where man really was a was a terrible enemy to elephant. And now up at the, uh, the headquarters at the management house, there's a water hole. And Rian um, Labaskakni, the first warden, one of my, one, I think the true heroes of conservation in Africa, um, he, he and had this little water hole and these bull elephants came up and um, in the heat of the day and would drink. And if you flick through to the next slide, um, you can see now that trust relationship where where 10 years ago there'd been immense poaching and today you they'll come up and take the hose pipe out of your hand and um yeah it's very moving so isn't that isn't that one of the most remarkable and beautiful things to the forgi forgivingness of these animals it really is and it's quite hard to to put words to that um you know it, it the emotional intelligence of elephants is is quite extraordinary and uh, it's a topic for a whole nother conversation um but that you know that that awareness of where of where their benefits are and the trust that goes into this is uh, is very heartwarming so let me just uh, quickly look at the question box oh cool not much happening uh but Michael, just I'm not sure where this presentation is, uh, is 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 going to. But just tell us a little bit about how did I manage within a time frame of ten years to restore that 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 connection between humans and wildlife? What what is the what is one of the main drivers of their success? Well, you know, they talk about a, a constituency for conservation, and um, obviously law enforcement. The, the 
the hard end of it is critical. Having a really highly trained, highly professional law enforcement team um, and a very modern one. You know, African Parks is certainly about best practice with their law enforcement and they spend as much time understanding the law and prosecution and evidence gathering as they do, you know, the, the more boots on the ground approach. Um, but law enforcement is critical and along with law enforcement is, is obviously um, information gathering and, and creating um, security for the communities around the park. So if the communities around the park feel, ben they feel the benefit of the park and they feel the security that the park provides, um, they will be more inclined to share information. And that, that is a huge piece of law enforcement. Without that, um, it's almost impossible. It really boils down to management. Uh, you know, and, and I think that, that it sounds very simple, but infrastructure, human resource development, community development, law enforcement, commercial development are, um, are all what they do. And it takes money, but the, 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 the outcome is an extraordinary park. Yeah, which means that they succeeded in making all those surrounding communities believe that there is actually a different kind of uh, future possible rather yes. than empty parks and always a ride for poaching. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Incredible. There's a different. Uh, so the trust that you're seeing here, you know, in, in some ways that photograph can talk about the trust with elephants and with man it can talk about tourism um, and it can talk, you know, sort of metaphorically for the broader trust that is that African parks has brought to the region. Yeah. 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 Cool. Bird life. I won't, um, I won't talk too much about this, but Essentially, I think that even birders are blown away by the birds when they come to even non birders <laughs> are blown away by the birds when they come to Zakuma. Again, abundance is part of the story, uh, but also the, the different species and the beauty and the photography for birds. I think it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. The carmine bee eater colonies this is the, the northern carmine bee eater, and I've never seen colonies anywhere else as big as this. You know, you'll get a colony yeah. that. It extends about 120 meters around a bank. Um, so, yeah, keep flicking through the bird life images. We don't have to spend too much time, but um, Bedouin snake eagle, quite a special bird for, for those who keen birders. Little green bee eater, again, um, a special one. Abyssinian roller, a close relative yeah, of the yeah. infamous lilac breasted roller. But yeah, the birds are, are truly special. And then the wildlife. Um, this this image i think is also for me quite a special one um it lions in sakuma don't tend to have very big manes this is a, a fully adult male lion and um this picture we was late one evening we saw him we were sitting on an open pan and saw him walking across the pan and walking towards us and knowing these lion um we got out the car and went and lay on the ground about 20 meters away from the car um, in enough line of sight so he could see where we were and make a decision about how he approached. And knowing also that the lions in Zakuma really are different. Um, this is not something you should really try in the Masai Mara. But the lions there, don't they don't have the aggression that they do in some places. And he walked straight up to us, um, or straight up to past us, and about 20 meters away, 30 meters away. And as he be sort of came alongside, he stopped and looked at us. I took this image, and um, he kind of didn't find us particularly interesting and turned around and walked off. But being, on, being able to be on foot um, with, with big wildlife in a totally safe and very wild area is extraordinary. It's also made possible because there are no other cars. It's just you. Yeah. You know yeah. that um, that you really do have this wilderness to yourself. So the lion viewing in Zakuma is is really surprisingly good. It's as good as you get in many parts of Africa, perhaps better. Beautiful. Both on foot and in vehicles. Cordofon giraffe, the, you know, this is a big thing in, in Zakuma. Um, one of the, the most important strongholds of Cordofan giraffe on the continent. 
and you'll get journeys of giraffe into the you know 30 40 50 almost every evening on on uh, regek pan you get these massive journeys which are quite spectacular uh, behind them you can see the the crown crane northern crown crane again this is uh i think there might even be an image just now but this uh let me flick through one more p if you don't mind yeah a bit more with these cranes the flock of crane that come into regek uh, every day are between five and eight thousand again it probably holds the majority of the northern crown crane population at this time of year and and hearing them all come in every morning uh, is is spectacular so you've got the wildlife and the bird life carry on there elephant again i love this image um it's a small family but again going back to that elephant story in in the beginning uh you know early 2000s to i mean 2010 12 13 the herd was always together it was never apart you got all of them in one big mass and um now this was again i think 2019 or 2020 you start starting to get small families breaking off and wandering on their own and just hanging out on the edge of the salamat river um i love that very evocative shot for me yeah beautiful yeah. and Carry a very a, a, be a beautiful sign that uh, we're taking it even one step further when it comes to trust yes yeah yeah, yeah. incredible to see Flick through a bit because we. Yeah. I'm going to go speed up a bit. I see quite a few questions. Now go back one short one very quickly. I want to just talk about those buffalo. Do you see they've got the, these wonderful hybrid buffalo between mm. uh, somewhere between the West African and the the Nile or Cape buffalo, um, and they've got these beautiful sort of tattered ears, and some of them with this orange coloring, which is very special. Big herds, up to a thousand, and uh, great both on foot and in better on foot some of the best on-foot buffalo uh, viewing you can do. Carry on down. I'm going to flick through. There are a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, yeah uh, let's let's have a look at the questions. I mean, we can always... Uh, yeah. Uh, presentation. yeah. So let's just stop the screen sharing and just scroll up a bit. Maybe go through, because there's a lot coming in and before we run out of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's focus on a few questions. Let's see. Uh, hey, Michael, could you touch on what to look for... Uh, red flags when choosing guides with a mind to genuinely benefit a local community ethical operations it's a really good question that and it's it's um you know in today's multimedia world <laughs> it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a lot of greenwashing going on and and how do you really um how do you sieve through uh, what is out there i i think the first comment is that most guides aspire to be good guides uh, most guides doing this because of of, of passion um, and you're more likely to get a good guide than a bad guide in terms of the ethics of it uh, the industry is also quite good at weeding out those who are not very good and who don't have good ethics but I think if you really are serious about it it's worth talking to some guests who've been on safari with that guy and ask the questions that are important to you in terms of um, community, wildlife ethics, et cetera, et cetera. And, and most guides, uh, reputable guides, would be quite happy to share with you one or two people who you could email and, um, and, and phone and have a conversation with. Yeah. You know, referral is the best way. Finding a guide on the internet is not the best way. Yeah. I hope that answers the question, Shannon. If not, please uh, let us know and we can dive deeper into it. Uh, Abner is asking, what are some of the unspoken or not well-known jobs related to conservation? I think most of the jobs in conservation are, are very are unspoken. Very unspoken and often yeah. not very highly um, uh, rewarded. You know, I think that the, the organizations like African Parks have a very deep human resource requirement. Um, and whether that's, uh, you know, in an office space, um, collecting data, doing marketing, whatever your skill set is, um, or whether that's in the field, um, logistically, operationally, whether it's community outreach, there, there really is, it's um, African Leadership University in Rwanda, which is a great university, um, has got a school of wildlife conservation. 
and they are now training people for the green economies um, and for all the different you know places within that green economy. So, you know, I think if you um, if you're keen for a for a, a career in conservation, also happy for you to, to you know to uh, get in touch with me directly. But there are ways to do it, and it depends on whether you want to live in the bush if you want to. Um, be urban and do something to contribute, uh, whether you want to, to support one of the important NGOs. There are many excellent NGOs out there. I, I do think that conservation and the green economies are going to become more relevant in the years ahead. And um, I think there's growing opportunity if that is a career that, that interests you. Maybe adding, I'll... maybe adding a bit from my side, uh, linking those two questions. Uh, I think it's always important if the questions come from a perspective of a guest to realize that the least thing you can do is engage with the people that guide you, engage with the people that make your beds, engage with the people that protect the parks. And the best way to do it is just show respect and curiosity into their lives. So one thing I've been doing over the past years is engage with everybody you meet. Just ask about their family, ask about their jobs. It's such a simple thing that goes such a long distance if it comes to people feeling valued, because there is so many people behind the scenes than the, just the guides and the rangers, right? If you only look at it from a tourism perspective, there are so many people working in and around the camps that deserve an equal amount of respect than the guide. And the guide is usually uh, the most important asset when it comes to your tourism experience, but just engage with all those beautiful people having life stories to tell. Just a little word from my side. Yeah, very valuable. And, and Abner, I see that you've just posted again um, if you, you know, I think that, that choosing a career in conservation, go to university if that lies ahead of you. And um, seriously, look at African Leadership University, specifically the School of Wildlife Conservation. It's in Kigali, in Rwanda, um, started by an extraordinary man. And um, it, uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think that might be a really good career path if you're interested. But as I said. Feel free to get in touch with me through through um, Prince for Wildlife. I'm happy for you to email if you would like some more some more input. Shannon is asking: Has African Parks found the local communities receptive to conservation? Are high levels of AP community engagement constant, or is it self maintaining now that the parks are proven? Um, I lost you for a second there. The local communities are. Uh, Yes, they are receptive. They, that is not an unequivocal 100% uh, receptive, obviously. You know, and it depends on the size of the community and the ability for that community to benefit from, from conservation. Um, and there are, there are parks where culturally it's more relevant and where it's not. So they are more, there are greater success stories. There's also areas where there is more human-wildlife conflict and if, if um, and I think human wildlife conflict is arguably more threatening to conservation today than than illegal hunting is, um, you know, is if your crops are being taken apart and, and people killed, it's harder to believe in conservation. So the way that conservation organizations engage with um, with communities is vital. Uh, it's also hard to develop real green economies that do benefit communities. Um, so it's it's by no means we haven't got a hundred percent solution. No one does out there, but um, it's the biggest challenge that we face really is to make communities, to make conservation relevant to people who don't necessarily believe in conservation. If that makes yeah. sense, yeah. it has to be valuable. It it doesn't have to be just something that we love because we're part of it. It has to have real relevance. And again. That goes to the core of what African Leadership University is, is, is aiming to achieve. And it also goes to the core of what African Parks stands for. Yeah. I mean, if you look at their local employment rates and how they empower local people to get involved into conservation, people that, that come from communities surrounding the parks they protect, I think that's one of the best practices in the business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mia, I see that you you asking. You know, do we have any suggestions um, on how we can best use photography to support and advance conservation for AP or indeed for any organisation? Um, 
it's really why I applaud Prince for Wildlife because there are very few ways that you can do that. You know, obviously, um, a number of photographers are, are sort of taking a P. I know you do this as well. They take a percentage of all their proceeds and they put them towards a couple of organizations that they believe in. And I think that has a, a twofold benefit. One, it, um, it, it provides revenue, obviously, for those organizations. And two, it creates awareness. So, you know, photography um, is important both in terms of raising money and perhaps more importantly, in creating awareness. So how can we use that in schools? Um, can we do any talks in schools? If, if I'm traveling and doing talks um, to potential guests, I quite often also like to do it at, at schools because you get, if we can get the youth to start believing in, in conservation, that is critical and photography really works. It has a high impact. Um, and, uh, and then I think also exhibitions, um, there's, there's a great shortage of wildlife exhibitions out there. Um, and I think maybe if some photographers came together and put together a really cool exhibition, um, hint, hint, P. You could <laughs> maybe you could have a travel <laughs> exhibition, um, which might be quite fun, and that could raise some real money because they could be large images, they could be auctions, pro proceeds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, um, I hope that gives some some thought. I mean, sky is the limit. Uh, I'm sure that one day. I mean, if I look at uh, uh, the amount of strong work I'm currently sitting on, just within the boundaries of Prince Wildlife. That on itself could make up for a stunning book, a traveling exhibition that travels the entire planet. It's just yeah. a shortage of time, really. But uh, yeah. I mean, I can very, very, very easily see Prince of Wildlife return in that form and shape. So yeah. who knows? Who knows? And it could be wonderful. And and um, I think it also we need to find ways to allow some of our lesser known um, photographers to showcase their work, and that's one of the things I love about Prince for Wildlife is trying to do that. So exactly. you know, photography also becomes a career choice for people who are interested in conservation. How can it, you know, there, there are many different ways. So that goes back, back to, to Abner's uh, questions. Is there any more questions on the chat? If not, I'm going to slowly round up the call. I mean, I could chat for two more hours, honestly, but uh, trying to keep it short and inspirational here. So if you have any more burning questions or burning topics, please drop them. If not, I'm thanking Michael for this uh, inspirational webinar. Cool. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Michael, it was a great honor. No, the honor was mine and the privilege. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And um, it's always fun to have these conversations and uh, look forward to more. And I look forward Thanks to very much. Life being a massive success. Four more weeks and it's happening. Yeah. yeah rather Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and see you next time. Bye bye. Take care.